Today we have uh, John Morgan. He's a proud Aboriginal man from the Daly River area with a long-standing family connection with this region, having lived in the community of Millingimby for decades. He is the chairperson of MeWatch Health and a strong advocate for Aboriginal health workforce development. An Aboriginal health worker himself, he has served on the boards of AMSANT, that's the Aboriginal Medical Services Alliance. Association of the Alliance. Northern Territory, Alliance Northern of the Northern Territory. Territory, the Northern Territory Indigenous Education Council and the Australian Bureau of Statistics Remote Area North. And I'll just say about MeWatch that it is one of two community controlled Aboriginal health services in Australia uh, that I think are the most innovative and the most effective. So listen closely to what John has to say. He's a powerhouse. Uh, we have Melanie Ratjiboy, is that correct? Yeah. Um, who's a young Yongu emerging leader. Well, I would say that she's a leader and has been for some time. She's part of MeWatch Health senior leadership. Well, there you go and acts as the Chief Executive Officer in the absence of the CEO. She is also the Chairperson of Dimuru Aboriginal Corporation, one of the local ranger teams. Um, Melanie is very passionate about leadership and is currently harnessing the learning of her experiences with Jarwin Emerging Leaders into a leadership excellence program for other up and coming leaders like herself. Over here in the middle is Professor Ian Anderson, is Aboriginal Tasmanian, but has spent the majority of his life in the Koori community in Victoria, where he has extensive family and community networks. Uh, that's because in the old days, there were some intermarriages, by the way, um, which, and he can recount the genealogies very clearly. Marvellous story. These connections are deeply rooted through the colonial history of the Bass Strait. During his 25 years of working in Aboriginal health, Ian has been an Aboriginal health worker, a health educator, and a general practitioner. Now, I jokingly say, but it's not a joke, I, when I introduce him, I say, this is Dr. 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 Ian Anderson. That's because he is a general practitioner. He has a medical certificate. Oh, do you have a practicing certificate? No. But he, do, he was, he was in, um, he was a, he's a graduate of the University, the University of Melbourne in medicine. And he could, I'm sure you did have a practicing certificate one time, he did, yes. But he also has a PhD in medical history and sociology. And he also has been awarded the Doctor of Science at the University of Melbourne, which is the highest award that can be awarded. So when I say... <laughs> doctor, 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 I'm not joking. Um, he worked as the Chief Executive Officer of the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service before becoming the Medical Advisor to the Office for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health in the Commonwealth Department of <coughs> Health and Aged Care. He's been involved in Aboriginal health policy development for, by my reckoning, it says here a number of years, 25 years? Yeah. He was the Chair of the National Indigenous Sexual Health Working Party that oversaw the first strategy in 1997. He chaired a working group for the National Public Health Partnership, which developed guidelines for the development, implementation and evaluation of national public health strategies in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. He was council member, a council member for the National Health and Medical Research Council from 2003 to 2006, and chair of its Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Forum. A uh, member of the National Advisory Group on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Information Data. Uh, he was board member of the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service, uh, a member of the Australian Bureau of Statistics Advisory Group and on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Statistics, formerly chair of the Indigenous Studies Subcommittee and currently chairs the Indigenous Studies Subcommittee for the Academic Board at the University of Melbourne, and formerly the Director of Research and Innovation at the Lurcher Institute, Australia's National Institute for Aboriginal and, Tylander, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Research incorporating the Cooperative Research Centre for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health. But uh, if you want to know about particle physics, he can also tell you about that. Um, 
I don't see a full bio for Professor Alan Cass, who's the director of the Menzies School of Health uh, Research here in the Northern Territory. Uh, but I do know that he's the kidney expert because uh, as the patron of the NPY Women's Council, we've all followed his work very closely. So I'm gonna hand over to you in a minute to tell us who you are. I'll go back over here to Dr. Lucas de Tocca. Is that correct? Correct. Lucas is the Chief Health Officer at Miwatch Health, the Regional Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Service for East Arnhem Land, where he's in charge of public health systems and programs and the management of Aboriginal primary health. He undertook medical school in Spain and Sydney, further training in public health at Harvard, where he focused on health systems and, and leadership in health and human rights. So I apologise, uh, Professor Cass, for not having a a biography of you. So if you wouldn't mind telling us uh, about you, your history and your role. I think um, saying that I'm director of Menzies School of Health Research and a kidney specialist is uh, uh, two of the most critical parts of, of my role. Um, uh, I suppose for 20 years now I've pursued a program of work uh, trying to address uh, better prevention uh, and management of chronic disease with a focus on engaging with Aboriginal communities, uh, health services, uh, universities and government to try to actually have a real impact on improving health outcomes. So that's what I do. Thank you. Now, to introduce this panel, I'll just say that one of our Close the Gap targets will be met in the next five years. Professor Anderson informs me that in the next five years, we're on track to close the gap on infant mortality, Indigenous infant mortality. <laughs> Other targets may be more difficult uh, to meet, but uh, we're on track to meet some of them. Um, for instance, um, in the last few years, the gap has been closed on Indigenous first-year enrolments in medicine. So that's another, you know, let's not forget the small targets. They mightn't re be reported in the Close the Gap report, but there are small targets and you, you know, from little things, big things grow. And I'll let Ian tell you about other targets because Ian's done a major worldwide study on uh, the deter social determinants of health. Um, and I'll leave it to him because he's the expert. Um, Gundimuk Wanambi is a Yolngu woman who has spent her working life working for her community in areas such as aged care, working with people in the long grass and being a member of the housing committee. In every role she has had, she's been an advocate and a voice for the community. When she got sick from kidney disease and had to move to Darwin, she didn't think she could do this anymore. However, she was inspired by the work of Dr Yunapingu and Yalma Yunapingu, who worked with Miwatch Health to establish dialysis services in Yirrkala so people can return to country for dialysis. Gundamulk is now a voice for the people like herself who want to ensure they connect, can connect with their country and family and culture by returning home and still be able to receive dialysis treatment to stay healthy and continue contributing to their community. So I can't tell you how devastating the, the spread of kidney disease is across Australia. Um, and, and this is why listening to this panel is part of the national project. These are very high priorities. We sh shouldn't be talking about the rest of it, everything else we do, unless we get these things right. So I urge upon you the critical importance of the work of these people and uh, Hand over to them. Uh, thanks, Professor Langton. Um, before we start the panel officially, I'd like to invite Professor Margaret Scheel, the Provost of the University of Melbourne and Acting Vice-Chancellor, to make a brief uh, presentation. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Sean, for allowing us this brief uh, interlude in the 
uh, proceedings. Last year, the University of Melbourne had the great honour of presenting a doctorate to uh, Galaroi Yunupingu in recognition of his great leadership and much of which we've heard about uh, in the last few days. I just want to take this time to acknowledge uh, an, the work of another exceptional leader. In 2015, the university established a new award to recognise our most distinguished professors. We have around 500 professors at the University of Melbourne and we plan to do about five of these awards a year. So this represents 1% of those outstanding leaders, so the very best of the best. The awards are named in honour of the founder of the University of Melbourne, Sir Redmond Barry. He uh, founded both the University of Melbourne and other public institutions such as the State Library of Victoria. And for those of you that are watching in Federation Square, if you wander up Swanson Street, you can find a statue of Redmond Barry in, in just outside the library. The Redmond Barry professors are nominated by the deans and the deans must provide evidence of outstanding uh, leadership of global recognition of their distinguished uh, research and scholarship. So it's fitting that uh, these uh, awards are named in honour of someone who was so committed to education. Redmond Barry was a colonial judge who founded, as I said, the university, but he was also, I, I'm, I'm informed on good, very good authority, namely uh, Auntie Sandra Smith Stevens, mo uh, Ian's mother, uh, that uh, he was also a friend to the Indigenous community. Uh, and, and that was a reputation that was a, a side that was sometimes masked by his reputation as a fierce juror, in part because he was uh, the judge who ordered the hanging of Ned Kelly. So he was a standout leader in, in his era. He was committed to education. And it's fitting that this week we have honoured one of our best, uh, and who's a great friend to this place, Professor Marcia Langton. So we're enormously proud of you, Marcia, for what you've done and what you continue to do. Thank you. Wonderful to, to be here for such an important presentation to uh, such a leader uh, in, this, in this area. Um, can I start by acknowledging the leadership of Galaroi Yunupingu, the traditional owners, the Gumach clan and the Yolnu people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. You now know my name is Alan Cass, and that I'm Director of Menzies School of Health Research at Charles Darwin University. Um, I've been working in the Territory for a long time now as a doctor and researcher. I first came to work as a junior doctor at Alice Springs Hospital in 1992. One Friday I was working at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney, and they said, uh, you're heading out to Alice Springs next Monday. Um, where I, I went, and I arrived for a three-month term in the hospital as a junior doctor. Um, I still remember caring for acutely ill Aboriginal patients from across Central Australia who came to the hospital uh, with a total lack of understanding or skills necessary to provide those people uh, with adequate or high-quality care. Uh, people would come to the hospital acutely ill, uh, we would uh, do our best, a, a chest x-ray might show someone had severe pneumonia, we would treat people with antibiotics and a few days later they would leave and go home and I can tell you that I as a doctor had no skills to understand what were the issues actually impacting on their health and well-being, to put in place working with any other services plans to keep people strong and healthy. Uh, and, and felt totally inadequate in, in the role that I played at that time. Six years later, I came back as a kidney specialist and researcher and then have done work to try to understand why there is such a heavy burden of disease. How might poverty get under your skin and make you sick? I think a topic that we'll discuss today. Uh, and how can we improve health services nationally to better meet the health, social and cultural needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Professor Langton summarised some of the key issues facing us. At times, I think we find the statistics, not at times, the statistics are confronting and often distressing. 
But I think today what we hope to do with the panel is give you some insights and understanding and encourage discussion about models of care that go beyond the traditional, uh, perhaps, siloed approach to health to really understand how social conditions, environment, uh, political factors, cultural issues impact on health and well-being, to discuss innovative models of partnership that might better address health needs, uh, and to unpick the very complex relationships between health and all those broader, broader outcomes. We have talked at Gama, and the newspapers have appropriately been focusing on Dondale, juvenile detention. Important for us in a health panel to understand that the burden of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in Indigenous and general communities, I'm not suggesting this is an Indigenous problem, but that this affects the neurological development and trajectory of young children that is critical to issues like juvenile detention. Similarly, in Central Australia, when there was a brief research project looking at hearing amongst the young Aboriginal men in detention, nearly all of them had hearing severe problems from recurrent ear infection. And again, you see that direct link between health, education, development of language, people's opportunities to take up employment and training, and one can then easily begin to think about those strong nexus with detention, particularly. Enough of an introduction from me. What I'm going to do to start is direct some questions to each of the members of the panel, uh, and really to try and unpick, unpick some of those issues. We talk about social determinants of health, and maybe I wanted to ask Melanie, could you explain to the audience, for example, about housing, what do we mean when we say housing conditions impact on or a determinant of health? Can you tell us how that might operate? Um, so one of the things that I like to embed um, in people uh, when talking about health, uh, housing, Indigenous, uh, Yolngu people, individuals and families is looking at it as concentric circles. So when, when there is one issue in community or with an individual, it affects not just the individual but the family the community and the household. So when we are talking about health issues in the community, we're not just talking about the house itself and the family that live in it. We, we're talking about the individual that lives in the house, the family, but also the community and how that affects the well-being of an individual or a family or a community. And M Melanie, when when I had three young children under the age of three, my wife and I thought our house was very crowded. Um, yet, it's obviously a very different issue to when we're talking about house crowding in remote communities and how that might impact directly on things like can people store med medicines or um, how, how are they able to prepare uh, and keep uh, food safely and things when there might be 20 people, you know, living in a two-bedroom house. Can you maybe paint that picture for us? Yeah, just come to my house. <laughs> 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 so, um, yes, um, like you have sort of a, you know, a different way of looking at how, um, you know, what you call a full house. Um, you know, people... Um, and I don't know, some of you might know, we have a very complex kinship system um, and I teach this at my workplace so, and I've told them it takes a degree to learn and understand the kinship system. This is the sort of things that apply to uh, our families and like us as individuals. So when you talk about housing and families, it's not a mother and child and two or three kids. It's a mother and child two or three kids, and then their extended families on both sides. Um, this is sort of an expectation for Yolngu to take in or accept someone staying in their house. 
um, whether it's short term or long term. Um, and that's that sort of the housing structure that you would see um, in most of our communities um, when you visit a house or you're talking to a person when they refer to their family, it's not just the immediate family, so husband and wife and kids, it's the extended family as well. Thank you. Um, Gundamul, could you maybe talk to us about how returning, you've returned to country and able to have dialysis on country. Um, how does that impact on a person, family and help the community more broadly? Well, I feel strongly, I feel strongly like coming back home to be with my family. And that's how it is affect me because of my kidney. I'm one of the kidney patient. And it fact that coming back home, it's a something like coming back to your family to see your grandkids and your other extended family because we feel like home. And as we know that this is our home, that's why we want to come back because where we're having the dialysis right now in Darwin is far away from our country. That's how I feel. Just to paint the picture, um, there are now 700 Aboriginal people across the Northern Territory who uh, need dialysis three times a week to keep themselves alive, and that's amongst close to 2,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people nationally. The vast majority of those people from remote and very remote communities must move away from their community, often hundreds of kilometres away, like from East Arnhem to Darwin, or the Kimberley to Perth, or uh, the APY lands to Alice Springs or even Adelaide. Um, so when we're talking about the impact, it's a really profound issue for people across remote Australia. Earlier, Gundamuk, you were describing to me how you try to help other patients when they go into Darwin because you have an understanding of the journey they might be taking. Can you talk about the important role of patients with that experience working with other people in their communities so that they have a better journey and are able to feel stronger about their health? Um, <clears throat> we've got a... At the... We've got an office there in Darwin, but connected to the uh, Purple House in Alice Springs. We work together and now we've got a committee. East Arnhem land people are starting talking to each other. And why is this? We formed a, a committee there in Darwin it's for the people who are new going into Darwin that, that got kidney disease because it's a something fairly new for them and they don't even know what is the kidney disease is really all about. So they need someone that been through through that sickness to explain to them what the next step is, what is going to be a next step after this. That means you are here in Darwin, there is no return unless you have to do your own, own home training to go back home or seeing that we've got dialysis machine here, 
two dialysis machines. One is over at Yirkala Clinic, and two is over at Yirkala Clinic, and it's one is over at the Nulunbo Hospital. And that dialysis machine is for those people who had already done the training, which is for us, we are, when we are there, and we give a chance to the people and ask them, first thing, before they, if they'll come here to have the treatment here at Yirkala Clinic, they have to go and see the doctor first to check out whether they are healthy enough to go out to the bush like here, mm -hmm. to Yirkala. So they'll be healthy enough to have a treatment here. So that's, that's the process that we are doing. And I'm always there with the uh, no, people who are we're working together, visiting the hospital, visiting especially to the Sabine A. That's where the dialysis ward is. So you see then a picture of leadership and passing on of knowledge from people from within the community to others as being so critical. Can I maybe extend from that to Lucas and John? And you all both you know, have fundamentally important roles at MeWatch. The community controlled health organisations, uh, the model that, that people are so proud about is the ability to provide a, a more comprehensive and holistic model of care. Can you maybe tell us some of the problems we're talking about and not, you're, you're a doctor, so you may not be someone who people go to to talk about housing or education or, or cult cross-cultural issues. How do community-controlled health organisations like MeWatch, how are they able to have an impact on those broader determinants of health? Uh, thanks, Alan. Um, I also, as a um, Balanda member of the panel, would like to acknowledge the Gumach people, um, and uh, I think it's good that we have our colleagues from MeWatch and from other organizations here because, um, again, I can only speak from my experience as a, as a non-Indigenous person, as a random Spaniard, in fact, that um, has, the, has the privilege at the moment of being hopefully somewhat useful in a particular role in this uh, great organization that I'm lucky enough to be part of. Um, but that's, that's exactly the key of the, of the model of the Aboriginal Community Control Health Sector that MeWatch, um, I think, is a great representative of, but that has 40 years of history and successes in this, in this country with over 150 uh, organisations in this model, which is the fact that um, social determinants of health and the model of, uh, and the conception of Aboriginal health, which is a holistic, community-driven understanding of well-being, um, is at the core of the operation. So, of course, a big part of it, and our sort of, um, and then as CEO normally puts it, our day job is the provision of our comprehensive primary healthcare services, under, underpinned by by human rights, um, because you know we we believe that Aboriginal people, remote or urban, should have the high standard of care, the same standard of care as the general population, and if anything. Um, because of the ex exceedingly and the, and the terrible burden of disease that we see in, in, in the population here, probably even more resources and, and, and a more um, specialised uh, type of service that um, um, populations with lower burden of disease might need. So that is definitely at the front end. Um, we need to make sure that um, healthcare is of the highest quality. But again, um, health is really about healthcare and it's definitely not only about healthcare. So unless we address the upstream um, determinants that are leading to this situation, uh, we're doing hardly nothing. And the most direct way to address these determinants is by what we see in MiWatch as two, as two fundamental pillars, which is a strong Aboriginal governance, ownership, leadership, and community accountability of the service. It has to be a service for the people, by the people, and directed by the people. And Renal and Gundamulk store is a good example. Um, traditionally, uh, dialysis services have been seen as a tertiary level care, something that happens at the hospital with the kidney doctor and the specialists. But it is within the community control sector, Miwach in Yerkala, Western Desert in Central, um, that the community leaders have said, actually, renal is very important. Um, coming back to country for dialysis is an absolute priority, so you make it happen. And, and we are making it happen, but it's only through that community leadership that they're thinking outside the box to meet community needs. 
uh, happen. The other side of it is uh, Indigenous employment um, and meaningful uh, and truthful um, Aboriginal health workforce development, because that, again, has a manifold um, effect into health. Um, on the one hand, we make the services more accessible and, 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 and more functional. You cannot achieve cultural, cultural competence just, just by doing a few trainings and a few courses unless a large proportion of your, of your workforce and the leaders driving that workforce are indigenous and an organization is hardly competent. But the other one is by employing in itself and being a meaningful source of wealth creation um, for, the, for the community, then there is a downstream effect for the families of those, those workers. Um, kids go to school if they see that their parents have a meaningful employment with a career development that leads to something. So we see um, social transformation and Aboriginal health workforce development as important as, it, as delivering health services within our organisation. Thank you. And can I maybe follow... John, would you like to add to those comments as chairperson of MeWatch and, and with your strong leadership in Aboriginal health workforce development? Yes, uh, firstly, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners here, the past and present and the future. The vision actually came. Our elders are the common law. Also, they are the civil law and also commercial property rights of intellectual property rights and trading. So our founders were very passionate because they see the future of what we've got today, which I give acknowledgement. And to pay the respect of our founders, I would like everybody to stand up as a sign of respect for one minute silent and acknowledging the sacrifice and the commitment that our forefathers and foremothers have created to what we are here today. So if we can make a stand, thanks. Thank you, you may be seated. I also would like to acknowledge my board of directors. One of the very strong, clear messages that our vision and our aspiration was I was one of the first and youngest um, elected um, chairperson, which I was quite actually terrified in the role because I thought I didn't have material qualities and the characteristics. But the beautiful thing about it to encompass all things that we are experiencing in our lives was I had the backing of my elders and it was a balanced gender. And I could remember it very clearly where we actually sp spoke about five particular things that our elders gave the opportunity to groom and mentor me and many others, the forecast of mentoring life coaches where we looked at the third space where we acknowledged the diversity of traditional mainstream and multiculturalism. I can remember very clearly in regarding to, we talked about the right balanced gender of finding the right people to co-assist and assist us with our working of not only health and well-being, but also the health and well-being of healing. And they spoke about also the pre and experiences of being traumatised. And it's something that I live still today. But I've chosen a path where I could actually look at getting myself an opportunity to be part of the forefront with the elders that gave me the blessing to go and do some leadership programs. And some of the initiatives was the actual Australian Indigenous... I did the, the Australian... It was a non-credited course that actually gave me a bit more understanding to navigate because if I had my role and I look back now, the wise words and wisdom of my elders are still actually in within me but also spiritually. And we talked about also in regarding to the right time and particularly the organising, the community contacts and a, and a picture, the story had to be innovated but also had to be a narrative where it had co-ownership and it had, to be, it had to be the ownership where it's grassroots initiatives to work in parallel with the ally approach. <laughs> Thirdly was the right place of location that was suitable and the relationship because if you don't have a relationship with your service providers and service delivery, 
then that's something that we all could actually start working very closely about and focusing on the 90% of commonality. The fourth was right language. And I'll give you a bit of a snapshot. And the second, last of all, was the right way. The language of the groups that you are meeting comes together that they have to speak their mother's language or in other jurisdictions, your father's language that complements your grandfather and your grandmother. In East Arnhem, I'll give you a clear picture. Situated in the far northeast corner of the Northern Territory of the mainland, has a population around 10,000 people that covers approximately 30,000 square kilometres and comprise of 10 major remote communities. Anurigu, Miliakba, also known as Bikadin, Numbawa, Ambakamba, Kapawiak, Kunyangara, Yirikala, Kalawinko, Milingimbi, and Ramangini. The social inclusion, what we also had to acknowledge the founders, was me, which actually was the creation of elders that lived on the homelands of Lena. The many homelands and the two towns of Nilamboy and Nirigu, five of the ten communities are located on islands. The needs of providing services in a large remote where people say it's a beautiful, it, it's something that we can go as a retreat. But in our world viewpoints and perspective, it is our equivalent of the biblical terms of it's our promised land. In regarding to that, the needs of providing service in a large remote communities where we've also classified in variations of the frontier, the first contact people, places and possibilities of social mobility. East Arnhem is culturally rich and linguistically diverse. Between 30 to 50 international languages with three large ma major language groups consisting of the Yulmo Mata speaking groups, the Nungapuyu and the Wendiliakwa, the Andiliakwa speaking groups. Within each of these major languages, blocks are, all, are also encountered in regarding to the multiple local dialects and variations. Once so, and experiencing this, we need to actually create interpreters because it's important to to be involved and actually showcase and, and respect that the wealth of knowledge and hold, knowledge holders, it's changing, it's evolving. Also, the primary health care is provided to the people of East Arnhem by four, four organisations, including the Top End Health Services, an agency of the Northern Territory primary health care providers, MIWATCH, also Lena. Lena Poi Homelands Association and Mother Colour Homelands Association. That's actually consisting of just about over a thousand people's needs in regarding to 19 homelands as a rough estimate. MeWatch was established in 1992 with the support from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Commission. The objectives have included developing a regional approach and ultimately controlling the development and, and has its approach to the community control pathways of regionalisation. The program has a way of implementing the actual, the original of the, the version of the founders of MeWatch. And it was very strong and embedded and, and, and implemented in quality investment was one health board to represent all our people of a first Australian people in MeWatch region. As part of dual diligence, governance, leadership, the elders spoke very passionately and said, we want to be part of everything. It's about social inclusion, but also have the legitimate, legitimate right so we can actually be having access to our clients and our constituents out there that it's comprehensive first-class services relevant of where you live, whether you live in Darwin, for example, whether you live urban, Remote, very remote. We're very inclusive. And in regarding to that, the background that I see, and it was a challenge, but the beautiful thing about it is that generosity. Our elders have laid the foundation for us to accept the challenge, but also we looked at concession plannings as well in regarding to how could we embrace our emerging leaders 
and also have we have positions that's identified as cultural mentors and life coaches. That is one of the critical competence competency framework that we are the experts. We can assess and we can screen you to say you're not yet competent. We work with you a little bit more because we take away the shame, blame and the guilt mentality because in our world viewpoints, we don't have a meeting for discrimination because everybody is equal and it's about equality and equity. Yeah. Ian, um, you've played critical leadership roles in health service delivery, working with government, and now in the university sector, and clearly, you know, in, in the audience, and at Gama we have <coughs> leaders from Melbourne University, Charles Darwin University, Flinders University in the Northern Territory. What roles can universities play in helping to address these broad and complex issues? And I suppose particularly uh, in terms of health workforce development. Okay. So I want to begin by acknowledging Gumech uh, uh, and Gunkula country to pay the respects of uh, my family who are Palawa Trawana from Plama Marana and Trawalawe clan groups in a country called Trevacana and Larapana, which is in translation Bay of Fires, east coast of, of Tasmania. Uh, to also acknowledge a number of the health leaders who are here and been working with over a number of years on, on some of the challenges that we all see. I, wanna, I just want to make an observation when I had my first job, it's actually my second job, my first job was bailing hay, which had absolutely no impact on my future life. My first job was working as an Aboriginal health worker. And that was a, 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 an amazingly profound experience of doing things like wound care, looking after Aboriginal aunties with diabetes, uh, looking after many of the things like young kids with malnutrition that shouldn't have been in the world. The kind of the problems that I, the problems I saw then are still the problems I'm dealing with as a Pro Vice Chancellor in part of the senior management team at the University of Melbourne. But I'm just working in a slightly different end of the healthcare delivery system. And they've been part of the problems that have been continually throughout the career. And I want to make that connection. In order to run a place like MeWatch, to open up MeWatch, you need a couple of things. You need a building. You need funding, you need community <coughs> engagement, but you also need people to work there, and people to work there who know what they're doing. And that's where the role of universities is absolutely critical. Both universities, but also organisations like Menzies School of Health Research, because our core business is producing people who know what to do in the delivery <coughs> of healthcare. And whereas, kind of behind the scenes, but our responsibilities here are as <coughs> profound and as important as the role of government in funding services and the role of community in leading services. So there, there are three key roles. Uh, workforce development, producing the know-how to make a difference, and one which I will hint at, which is equally important, is building some of the relationships and connections that actually makes it all happen. So on workforce, um, one of the critical bits of work over the last 15 years has been on changing the ways in which doctors, nurses, health workers, uh, physi um, uh, physiotherapists are trained in relationship to Aboriginal health. Now, we wouldn't expect someone to do good surgery if you didn't give them any training in surgery and just gave them a knife, but for a long time we've been expecting people to do good health care with Aboriginal people by just <coughs> parachuting them in. So very big uh, uh, workforce development agenda around the curriculum reform. A piece of work that I was involved in over a number of years and colleagues like Ron Mokak was working with the medical deans of Australian New Zealand medical schools. Two things, two tasks. One is to uh, get them to give good high quality training to doctors to prepare them for working uh, well with our people. Uh, and the second thing is to actually find pathways for Aboriginal uh, students into medical education. 
Uh, so we developed a national curriculum workforce uh, framework over 10 years ago and been subsequently working on ensuring that that high quality training is embedded in medical education but also in other fields like nursing and so on. Um, a part of that is to also provide, and that's, that's for all, all tr health trainees, but there's a small group who are very likely to spend a significant part of their working lives in Aboriginal health. We want to also be able to provide them with high quality placement experiences in places like MeWatch so that they can actually learn from people who know and actually want to come back uh, and continue to work in the field. The other, the other bit of work which is also parallel to that is to make sure that that workforce has possibilities for Indigenous Australians and I'll come back and talk about. The, the, the know-how is also critical. Many of the challenges uh, that are faced, particularly here in the north of Australia, Aboriginal health challenges, the rest of the world have kind of forgotten about and not really focused on. So we, we need to make sure that when our people are looking at developing good, high quality research, that they're also listening to the needs of people up here. What are the problems here that require a focus, a challenge? You know, how do we better treat scabies? You want to really kind of close the cycle on, on renal disease, you're going to have to really tackle skin disease. What are the best treatments? What are the best practice models? We've got to get our best and brightest minds focused on those problems, not just the problems that people confront in Melbourne or in Sydney. The third, the third plank of that is universities also provide places, meeting places, where people come uh, to talk about challenges. And we, we are ways in which we can provide connections between what's happening globally in Indigenous health in Canada, New Zealand, uh, in Scandinavia, in Africa and Asia, to what's happening here. And I think that's a really critically important role. I just want to finish on talking about the challenges for Aboriginal students. We are nationally at a transition point in Aboriginal education. Um, we often hear about the challenges, we don't often hear about the good news. Uh, this year we have 15,000 uh, Aboriginal students in university education. That has never been as large as this in Australian history. It is growing at a rate of about 6% per annum. In other words, the number of Aboriginal students coming into universities is growing faster than non-Indigenous Australians. Yeah? Okay? This is absolutely fundamentally important. We have a future capability in our grasp. Yeah? We are going to halve the gap in retention into year 12 in the next five years. Some states have closed the gap. Our kids are getting educated and our kids are getting educated in the university system. So we mentioned that um, we, uh, Marcia stole a little bit of my thunder, about 2011, the number of Aboriginal kids coming into first year medicine, from Australian kids, not international kids, coming into first year medicine was 2.7%, okay? We've closed the parity gap for the first year medical cohort. Now, we've got th about three, just under 300 Aboriginal doctors now, 250. Um, 20 years ago, when I graduated, well, actually, 20 years ago when I started medicine, there was not another Aboriginal doctor in the country. Right? We are changing the landscape of Aboriginal health. There is no reason to believe that MeWatch in, say, 15, 20 years' time could not only have excellent community leadership as a CEO, have an Aboriginal uh, uh, board of management, but can actually reasonably expect to have Aboriginal doctors, Aboriginal nurses, Aboriginal physiotherapists and other Aboriginal workers in that organisation. Mm -hmm. And I think that we should set that as a realistic educational target. This is an achievable goal. There are some AMSs, community controlled health services in this country that are almost close to that. All right? But in order to do that, going down the social determinants of line, we've really got to pour, uh, we've got to really focus on building opportunities for education locally. We don't want to have to have every Aboriginal kid who has an aspiration to be a doctor have to leave their community to realise that aspiration. We've got to actually build the educational capacity, work collaboratively with 
the schools, teachers, government, other universities here in North East Arnhem Land to make that an absolutely achievable vision. It is, but we've got to work cleverly and we've got to collaborate. Um. <laughs> we are well over time, so I'm sure I'm in terrible trouble with uh, Sean. Um, however, I'd like, if I'm allowed to, um, if there's the opportunity if for brief questions or comments, maybe for a maximum of five minutes, would people like to do that? Or the other um, might need to move. All right, well, in that case, what we should do, well, I knew we were over time. Um, uh, so I think if people can join me in thanking the panel, there are people... I'm sure there will be many opportunities to talk to people on the panel, discuss these issues, other people in the audience who play critical roles in universities, uh, health organisations, research organisations. So please continue the discussion. Uh, if we are to continue on the path to close the gap in infant mortality and address the critical issues of chronic disease and other things, we must do it together. We must challenge our research organisations, our universities and our governments to get out of their comfort zone, to come up with the type of innovative solutions that have been discussed and to listen to Aboriginal people, families and communities when they talk about their experiences and suggested solutions to these issues. Thank you. Thank you.